you today. Can we just read together? As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, impartations, and divine manifestations, anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessings, and increase upon me, so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings and you just keep pouring out on us. Your word says every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father with heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. God, you just, we know that all the good in our life is from you. Every blessing and perfect gift is from you and we thank you for it. And we are so thankful for your presence. And Lord, as we go to your word right now, it's the Holy Spirit, come Bring the fire of your presence, the blessing of your presence, and speak and minister and encourage and just draw us into your presence, into your worship, and receive the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, I thought I was done with Jacob last week, but I just couldn't do that. <laughs> another, another, there's another Jacob sermon here, so we're, we're going to look at Jacob again today. And uh, it just... Um, struck me as too interesting and too good to pass up. And, um, whoa. It's probably to keep a lot of papers in the Bible. Just kind of empty things out. Right. Sorry to beat the, the <laughs> mic with the papers. Oh, I know it's very annoying. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm going to, uh, we'll, we'll be reading a portion of the text. I think I have, um, we're looking at Genesis chapter 34 and 35 this morning. And I'm going to tell you about 34. We're not going to read all that. It's just way too much text. But, but um, you're familiar with the story probably. So I'm, I'm going to, um, and then we'll read um, a, a section of chapter 35, a pretty good section of chapter 35. But in, in chapter 34, Jacob Keep in mind, God had told Jacob in, in Genesis chapter 31, when God appeared to Jacob, he told him to return to the land of your birth. Okay? He told him to go back to the land of his birth. And Jacob partially obeyed. Okay? He took off with his family and his goods. Of course, Laban caught up with him. And then he had an encounter where, where Esau met him. And, and, he, and he lied to Esau. And he said, we're, we're coming. You know, and it just... But Esau went one direction, and, and he went the opposite direction. But he actually at first did not return to the land of his birth. He parked himself right, right there in, in, the, in the land of, of um, Shechem. That's it. The, the city of Shechem in the land of Canaan. And that ended up posing a problem for him. And I mean, you know, when God tells you to do something, you better just follow through all the way <laughs> instead of to take shortcuts. Well, he had a mind of his own, and, and he decided that he was going to park himself in, in Shechem, and um, now to his credit, he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, God, the God of Israel. So he, he did an act, an act of, of worship, but while he was there, his daughter Dinah um, went into the city of Shechem to meet up with some of the other daughters of the land and to get to know them, and you, you, probably, you probably know the story. When, when Shechem is actually the name of the son of Hamor also, and when Shechem saw Dinah, he, he, he got excited about her and thought, you know, here's a beautiful woman. And he abused her and raped her. And um, he went 
when, when um, Jacob got word that she'd been raped, he just kept silent while his kids, his sons were out in the field. His sons came back, and when they found out about it, they were living. They were just really angry that this had happened. Shechem wasn't through, though. He decided that he loved, he loved Dinah. Okay, that, that was his thing. He spoke gently to her after he raped her. Okay, that's a bit of a huge contradiction. But he decided he wanted to marry her. So he went to Jacob and to Dinah's brothers, and he asked them to marry Dinah. And, and they, the, the brothers came up with a scheme and said, well, we couldn't intermarry with you because you guys are not circumcised. So keep in mind, circumcision was part of the holy covenant between Abraham and, and, and the Israelites. And, you know, God's people, this was a very holy thing. And they're about to take something that's holy and use it in an improper fashion. Okay, the Bible doesn't go into a lot of detail on that, but you just have to keep that in mind to show that the, that the, the brothers acting deceitfully are acting deceitfully was something that was very important in their relationship with God. So they told Shechem and his father that if they, if Hamar, that if all the men in their community would get circumcised, then they would agree to let Dinah marry. They could intermarry their daughters, etc. Well, so they lost no time. And, and, you know, Shechem and Hamar went to the men of the city and they told them, listen, if we marry them, this guy has lots of goods. He has all kinds of flocks and their stuff will be our stuff and, and it's going to be a good situation. So they went and, and all these men were circumcised in, in the community. And, and then three days later, Simeon and Levi, two brothers, Leah's two sons, got together, grabbed their swords, went into the city of Shechem and destroyed all the males. Think about it. One man sinned. One Shechem sinned. And he killed all the males in the city. Now I thought about it a little bit. I, you know, the, the Bible doesn't elaborate in, in a, in a lot on it. You wonder why? You know, why? Why kill all those men? And I thought, well, it may in part, it may have just been pure revenge all the way across the board. And they just hated them all. Just want to kill all of them. Shechem's bad. The whole pot's bad. You know, it's. It's also possible that they knew that if they killed, because Shechem and Hemer were the leaders of the community, that if they killed the son, that the father and the other men of the community would rise up and destroy Jacob and his family. The Bible doesn't say that, but I thought it through a little bit. And I thought, you know, it's possible that there was a reason for destroying all those, so the men couldn't retaliate and, and come back on them. Jacob wasn't real impressed with their actions. Okay, in fact, it, it, later in Genesis, when, when Jacob was about to die and he called, he called his uh, sons together, he actually um, spoke some words against their anger. And, um, and it, 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 he makes it very clear that he was not impressed uh, with their actions. That's in Genesis 49. And, and I'm going to read just those, a, a few of those verses so you can see. He says, Simeon and Levi, this was his prophetic word for Simeon and Levi, are brothers, their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly. Because of their anger, they slew men. And in their self-will, they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Which, by the way, was fulfilled. They, they were scattered. They were dispersed, excuse me, in, in Israel. And, um, but when Jacob found out what his sons did, his thought was the neighboring people were going to destroy him. And he told them such. He said, he said in, in, again in Genesis 34, he said, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious, in other words, be obnoxious, among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. In my men, being few in number, They'll gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed. He said, I am my household. But the brothers said, should he treat our sister as a harlot, as a prostitute? So Jacob is afraid. 
He now is fearful that his whole family is going to be destroyed. God steps into the scene now. Enter God into the picture. And um, in, in chapter 35, this is where I want to begin reading. And, and, and I just want to look at what takes place here with God in relationship to Jacob and his family. <coughs> said, then, then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and live there. And make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I'll make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was near Shechem. Okay, it's interesting. So God, God steps in. Jacob's afraid he's going to be destroyed. And God says, arise and go to Bethel and live there. Okay. And again, keep in mind, if he had followed God's original instructions and went back to the land of his family, at the very least, he would have passed through Bethel and probably had an encounter with God at that point. That, that, so there was some delay in that taking place. But finally, he said, put away the foreign gods which were among you. you know, who was it in Jacob's family that introduced foreign gods to him? Remember? Rachel. Rachel. She took the father, her ladies, you know, household idols and brought them with them. And so now they got all these idols in their house. They're going to go to God and, 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 and seek God's help. And Jacob at least has the sense to know we're not going to take these false gods with us into God's presence. So he tells them to get rid of the foreign gods. And, um, and I'm not sure what the earrings had to do with anything, but apparently they, they, they felt there was some connection between the earrings that they were wearing and, and of their idol worship. So they, they, they got rid of them. They buried them near Shechem. And it says as they journeyed, in verse 5, as they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So something supernatural is taking place here. God is causing the people. This isn't the only time in the Old Testament we see this. Where it says a great fear came on the people. And you know that God is working so that they know better than to attack them. Because taking this trip would have otherwise been very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. Especially in light of the fact that he's already ticked off the neighboring Americas. And uh, very well could have been destroyed. Verse 6, So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people which were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and, and she was buried below Bethel under the oak. It was named Alan Bacchus. And we have no idea why Deborah was even there. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's really no indication in the Bible about where she come from. That's why I was with. Where Deborah came from? I thought she belonged with, with Rebecca. So apparently at some point uh, that Deborah was sent to be with Jacob and to travel with uh, Jacob. And, and uh, so she died and she's buried. And it says, then God appeared to Jacob again, because we know he appeared with, uh, to him when he was escaping from Esau. He appeared to him. It says, now he's appearing again. And when he came to Peter and Aaron, and he blessed him, okay? And God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Keep in mind that God has already said this before, but he doesn't seem to get it, okay? He's a little bit slow to pick up on his identity as a prince, okay? A, a prince of God is what Jacob means. He, he's still kind of walking in the Jacob identity, that of a, a deceiver. Okay, and his, his sons are following suit in, in, in deceiving um, Shechem and, and, his, and his family and the people. He said, and so he's reminding him of, of his identity. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Now, how many of you know that there are a lot of Christians that, and maybe we all struggle at times, 
to remember our identity, to remember that we belong to the King of Kings, that we are royalty, that we are priests of God, that we are holy ones, that we are saints, that we have been cleansed of our past sins. And, and when we forget our identity and, and go back to the old identity, the, goal, the old identity of, of, of thinking of ourselves as, 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 as sinners, or it, it, we, we get into a, we, a pattern of spiraling doubt instead of a pattern of victory. Our, our hearts must be tuned with heaven so that we see ourselves as God sees us. We understand our identity, that we are loved, we are forgiven, we are cleansed. We don't have to, in fact, we can't earn that cleansing. It's already been purchased for us through Jesus. So God's reminding him of his identity, that his new name is, is, is Israel and uh, Prince of God. He says, thus he called him Israel. Verse 11 says, God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. This is important. Because what, what does this tell you? You're going to live. You're not going to die. <laughs> That's what he was afraid he's going to be destroyed. God is saying, no, you're not going to be destroyed because a nation and a company of nations are going to come for you and kings are going to come from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I'll give it to you and I'll give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. It says, Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was some, still some distance to go to Ephraim, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Oni. Okay. And um, ben, ben Oni, if you look in the footnote of your Bible, as I'm going to do right now, mine is called, means the son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin. Okay. And, and Benjamin means the son of the right hand. J Jacob chose to give him a better identity than that of the son of sorrow. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over a grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and kissed his tent beyond the tower of Eder. It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. What captures my, my attention when I'm reading this is you, you think about the encounters that Jacob has had with God. He's, had, he's seen angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And he's had angels come and, and, and meet with him. And, he, and he's heard God speak to him. And even here it says that God spoke, appeared to him, and then he went up from him. So apparently there was some sort of a physical encounter with the Lord. And he's had these encounters, but knowing God and knowing that you belong to God, knowing that you're a child of God, doesn't mean that you will not have serious trials and crises that come. He just spent time with God. The Almighty had met with him and promised that he'd be fruitful and multiply and a nation and a company of nations, all these wonderful promises they go and they travel further. We don't know how much time elapsed before he moved on from Bethel. But, but he, he moves on and, and his wife, his favorite wife, Rachel, dies. And you know he's heartbroken over this. And then his son goes and sleeps with his concubine, Bilhah. So knowing God doesn't mean you aren't going to have problems. You know, it, there, there's um, David Guzik. Uh, wrote, wrote, wrote this when he was commenting on uh, uh, the, the passing of Rachel. He said, this also shows that even when we get right with God and return to our first love, 
It doesn't mean life becomes only ease and comfort. There are constant challenges, us, challenges for us to trust God. He said we cannot price comfort more than getting right with God. For some, comfort is their idol. A false god they worship with constant pursuit and attention. Some only want a comfortable life, not a godly life. The symbol for some Christians seems to be an easy chair, not a cross. I like that image. Okay, I like my easy chair, but I, I like that image. <laughs> it, sticks, it sticks in your head real good. The symbol for some Christians seems to be an easy chair, not a cross. Problems come, trials come, heart it comes. They get angry with God, they get mad at God. Sometimes they reject God, they turn away from God. And, and to turn away from God is to turn to disaster. It's to turn to hopelessness. You know, what, what was when all the disciples deserted Jesus, a, a huge group of disciples deserted Jesus, and Jesus looked at his, his 12 and says, you don't also want to, to turn away and desert me, do you? What did Peter say? Where will we go? You have the words of life. You know, where, where would we go? There is nowhere else. There is no other. There is no other name. We, in, when, when Jacob was on his um, deathbed concerning Reuben, he, he did not have complimentary prophecy on his behalf. He said, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Interesting detail. Reuben was the firstborn. Then we have Simeon and Levi. Reuben and Simeon and Levi all committed pretty heinous sins. So God bypassed them. And he went to Judah. Judah was the tribe. The fourth son was the tribe of Jesus. King. Judah was David's tribe. In the tribe of our city. And by the way, there's actually a prophecy, I think, of that. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lunar's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Before he died, Jacob had some very powerful prophetic words to speak. Here's the point that comes, comes to me. Whether your life is smooth sailing or whether it's stormy, God calls us to worship. He calls us to his presence. When the storms hit Jacob, God said, go up to Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. Go up to Bethel. He went to Bethel and built an altar of worship. When things are going well, we need to go to Bethel. And it'll make it a lot easier to go to Bethel when things get stormy because we have a habit and a pattern of it. We know God is our answer. He's our hope. He's our life when things are going well. So when things get nasty, we can look back and say, you know what, Jacob had face-to-face -face encounters with God. And yet look at the heartache and look, look at the difficulties that he faced. Look at Job and, and, and all the hardship he had. And, and it says he, he, he got up and he, he said, Naked, I came from my mother's womb and naked I'll be. I will die. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He went to worship. Even though he didn't understand what he was facing. Our call is to be worshipers. We're born for it. Our purpose. Our destiny is to be worshipers of him. And in worshiping him, we discover our, his plan for us and the guidance and the direction that he has for us. Our security is in the presence of God. I want to share one last thing. It's funny. This, this is this kind of an unplanned thing, but it popped. This book caught my attention when I was walking through the house this morning. And usually when that happens, that means there's something there that, that it will be a blessing to somebody. So I, I opened it up and kind of glanced through and I found this 
this story, and many of you have probably figured out that I really like Norman Vincent Peale. I just think his writings um, are so helpful in many levels. And, um, but there, there's a story, this book is called Stay Alive All Your Life. And um, a, a couple, there's just two things that I wanted to share out of this. One, one was a lady that, um, actually the, the section of the church, or, was, was every, every week at the back of the church, he would notice these wads of paper in the, in the corner, these little I mean, purple papers. And he, he thought, what in the world? So he finally opened one up, and, and, and it, had, it had like some names on it. It said, uh, Clara Ill, Lester Job, right? just a short phrase. And then what is this? And it kept happening every Sunday. And so he watched one Sunday, and he saw the woman that was doing it. And, and he told the pastor about it, and, and the pastor asked if he could speak to her after the service. And he said, we, we, he showed her the papers. He said, we've seen these papers. And, um, and just, he gently inquired about the meaning. And she said this, she said, you'll, you'll think it's silly, but I saw a sign among the advertising posters in a bus which said, take your worries to church and leave them there. <laughs> Take your worries to church and leave them there. You know, Jacob had a lot of worries. <laughs> Some were self-inflicted by his own family. And the place to take him was the house of God, to his presence. She said, my, my worries are written on those pieces of paper. I write them down during the week, bring them on Sunday morning, and leave them. I feel that God is taking care of them. Her pastor said, God is taking care of them. Please continue to bring your worries and troubles to church and leave them there. On his way out of the church, the pastor picked up one more piece of paper. He opened it up and it said, John, in Korea. One last thing I wanted to share, I really like this. He said that a, a, a professor of English literature wrote the following method that she had for dealing with the worries and struggles that she had. And uh, she sent this for me. Said, she said she would sit back in a straight chair, let her hands drop to the side, relax her body. And she said, I say the following each three times. Tranquility, serenity, quietness. Peace, faith, love, joy. I have the habit. Now notice these are positive declarations. It, it's, you may not... It may not be always this way for you, but it's like a faith statement that you are determined to have a reality in your life. When you make those kind of declarations, you tend to move in that direction. So I have a habit of happiness. I have a habit of expecting the good. I have a habit of never giving up. I have a habit of patience. I have a habit of trusting the living God. I have a habit of helping others. She said, if I find myself getting stirred up about anything during the day, I say this. The tendency to brood and fret never solved any problem yet. Worry is a rocking chair that never takes me anywhere. <laughs> that sticks. I like rocking chairs. That really goes. I never heard. How many of you have heard that expression before? Any of you? Okay, a couple of you. I've never heard that before, and, and, and I like that. It's a... Worry is a rocking chair that never takes me anywhere. Well, J Jacob had a lot of worries. He had a big family. He had a lot of things that went wrong at different times. And his problems weren't over yet because he went through a lot of heartache with Joseph. But he learned that God was the answer. He learned that that's where his focus needed to be. God called him when, his, when he was scared, when he was afraid his family was going to be destroyed. God said, go to Bethlehem. Go up to Bethlehem. We don't have to travel far to be in the house of God. You don't have to wait till Sunday morning to be in the house of God because you are a house of God. You are a temple of his presence. And he loves you and he wants you to, to not only know intellectually but to know by experience and through the, his presence with you to meet your every need to carry you through storms, to bring you through this life safely to his eternal presence.
Let, let's stand, and we're gonna, I wanna close the message with that. So let's just, if you wanna extend your hands to receive a blessing from the Lord today, I'm gonna ask him to bless you. Because I know that different ones here, that y'all have different struggles, different trials, different things that you face. Father, most high God, Father, what everyone here needs more than anything is your touch. They need to touch the hem of your robe or have you reach out and touch them to bless them, to embrace them with your peace, with your love, with your care, to speak your healing, to speak your restoration. And I pray, God, for you, that touch. You are our hope. You are our fortress, our deliverer, our strong tower, our mighty God, our Savior, our King. And we believe your word is true when you said, we're two or three come together in my name, they're my enemies. I pray for a, 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 just a complete release of any pain, of any illness, for complete healing for mind and body, spirit, soul, where, wherever there are wounds. You're the great healer, the great physician. And you delight to heal and touch your children. So bring your blessing right now. In Jesus' name we ask. And we receive from you what you have for us today. And we worship you with all that's in us. Glorify your name. I pray for each one of us, God, that we would be alive make the most of every opportunity, always ready to give an answer for the hope that we have, to lift up Jesus to others, to invite people to worship, to go to Bethel, to go to your house, to be a part of Destiny Church, to be a part of your church around the world. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for...